I know what you're thinking. Clara, Hakeem Olajuwon was the face of the 90s Rockets we know and love. He didn't have beef with them, you beautiful idiot. But it's true. In 1992, we had name calling, a fake injury accusation, threats of lawsuits, and eventually, Olajuwon demanded a trade that if it had gone through, would have changed the course of NBA history. Hakeem felt at home in the city of Houston since he was a college student, before that even. He grew up in Nigeria, and when he flew to America for college visits, his first stop was New York. He made his way through the crowded airport, stepped outside into the cold, stepped back inside, and bought a ticket to Houston. It ended up being a good call. At the University of Houston, he and teammates the likes of Clyde Drexler and Benny Anders formed the tallest fraternity in Texas, Phi Slamma Jamma. In an era where dunks weren't always encouraged, the Houston Cougars encouraged them, playing fast, fun, dominant basketball. They captivated the city and took the team to the NCAA Finals twice in a row. Now, I will admit they didn't win either of those finals, but like, still, that's pretty impressive. Olajuwon declared for the 84 draft, foregoing his last year of college eligibility because the Houston Rockets had a 50-50 chance of getting the number one pick, and he really wanted to stay in Houston. The Rockets already had a big man in Ralph Sampson, but the city of Houston so loved the dream, there was no question that the Rockets would take him if they could. In a stroke of luck, the Rockets won the coin flip for the first overall pick, and with it, drafted Hakeem Olajuwon. Simple as that. Everyone was happy. Olajuwon got to stay in his city, and the Rockets got to lowball him because they knew he wanted to stay. Olajuwon seemed to blame GM Ray Patterson more than owner and car mogul Charlie Thomas. He ended up with a contract he didn't love and a bad, slightly beefy taste in his mouth. But that taste was soon washed out with a rich, smoky flavor of success. Teamed up with fellow big man Samson, the Rockets' offense ran through the two seven-footers in the post. And their defense also benefited from having two tallies playing in tandem. In just a sophomore season, the Rockets strutted through the playoffs. And no, I didn't think of the verb strut myself. I got it from this 86 Rockets playoff run promotional rap. Houston lost the finals to the Celtics in six games, but hey, the future looked bright. Olajuwon signed an eight-year contract extension. This time, there were no hard feelings. He and Charlie Thomas had developed what Hakeem would later describe as the best player-owner relationship in the league. Thomas told the press they were close friends. Olajuwon would go to Charlie's house, hang with his family, ostensibly ride in Charlie's hundreds of classic cars. Plus, in 89, the GM who made Hakeem uncomfy, Ray Patterson, stepped down. Steve Patterson took over the job and boasted the honor of being the youngest GM in the league, though if he said that, he'd also have to mumble, because my dad gave me the job. At this point, you might be wondering, like an outspoken old lady in a fast food commercial or a dog served discount dog food, where's the beef? Well, let's start with how the Rockets never capitalized on their 86 success. Olajuwon kept playing well, but the team couldn't get past the first round of the playoffs for years. In February of 92, they were 26 and 26 and doing stuff like blowing a 24 point third quarter lead to lose to the worst team in the league. Charlie Thomas abruptly fired coach Don Chaney, which Hakeem didn't like, but he didn't say anything at the time, perhaps because he was trying to negotiate a $15 million contract extension. Well, it maybe wasn't the best time to ask for a raise, you had to consider that the other elite centers in the league were making more than him. Just a few months prior, Patrick Ewing signed a rather large contract extension. So Olajuwon is sitting there making about $3 million a year, while somebody with the exact same job title signed an extension for $9 million per year? He's got to speak up whether his coach was fired and he just lost to the worst team in the league or not. Thomas and Patterson Jr. were not receptive. They cited a clause in Hakeem's contract to avoid the conversation. That clause said if Hakeem tried to negotiate before 95, he'd lose six million bucks. While it's possible they just didn't want Hakeem to violate his contract, there's another reason Charlie Thomas was reluctant to promise Hakeem money. Thomas was trying to sell the Rockets, and a potential buyer isn't going to pay loads of money to Charlie if he's also got to pay loads of money to Hakeem. On Monday, March 16, Hakeem declared they needed to negotiate with him or trade him. Management just kind of ignored that. 
On Tuesday, Olajuwon strained his hamstring in a game against the Clippers. It may seem these events have little to do with each other, but according to Thomas and Patterson, this was a simple case of cause and effect. They believed Olajuwon's injury was fake, a power play to force them to talk about his contract. Team doctors said Hakeem was fine to play in Saturday's game, but Hakeem said he couldn't. He got a second opinion, which said he should sit out, and he sat out. Clearly pissed, the Rockets didn't list him as injured, they listed him as refused to suit up. Patterson suspended him indefinitely and took to the press with his fake injury allegation. He tried to sway fans, saying ticket prices would have to triple to give Hakeem the contract he wanted. He said stadium employees would have to take pay cuts so Olajuwon could get richer. Now, while this might be enough beef for an old lady or a dog, we've got more. Olajuwon's agent called Patterson's suspension and accusations the most incredible declaration of war he's seen. Olajuwon staged a counterstrike. His point of attack? Patterson inherited the GM job. He didn't earn it. Patterson suggested they both take a polygraph test, but for one reason or another, a lie detector never made an appearance. So, we have to figure out on our own. Was Hakeem Olajuwon faking the injury? The Rockets provided an MRI that showed no sign of swelling or tearing or bleeding, but Olajuwon never said any of that happened to his hamstring. He said it was strained, which wouldn't show up in an MRI. Also, Hakeem had a reputation as a dedicated player. The executive director of the NBA Players Association pointed out he'd never done anything close to faking an injury in the past. Olajuwon had actually come back early from injury twice in his career. His teammates didn't doubt him. And remember that promotional rap from 1986? Even that song referenced his work ethic. But whether he was faking or not, the insinuation was out there and it cost him in reputation and cash. Both sides threatened to sue each other, Hakeem looking to win a little more than Patterson. Olajuwon missed five games while suspended and or injured, and the Rockets lost all five of those games. It's even worse than it sounds, this was late March, and the Rockets were fighting for the eighth seed, which they did not get. Hakeem demanded an apology and a trade. He wanted out because of the injury accusation and contract, sure, but also because he'd lost faith in Charlie Thomas and Steve Patterson. A championship was not their top priority. Lots of other teams did prioritize a championship and wanted Hakeem. The rumor mill churned all summer long. But summer turned to fall and Olajuwon did not get his trade. He also didn't get his apology, but I have a feeling that was a secondary request. Why didn't the Rockets trade him? Because Charlie Thomas was trying to sell the team and make bank doing so. On media day for the 92-93 season, Olajuwon called Thomas a coward and said Steve Patterson wasn't even worth talking about. He was still holding out for a trade and had no plans to discuss other options with the Rockets. Or, as he eloquently put it, silence is the best answer for the fool. Charlie Thomas also had some media day comments. He said he wasn't friends with Hakeem and he didn't want to be. So Houston was starting off the season on an ugly note, but at least they got to go on a trip. In an effort to expand their global audience, the NBA season openers that year took place in Japan. Charlie Thomas brought his wife and kids along, and instead of being like, oh, cool, two kids under 10 on my 14-hour flight, Hakeem was like, I miss this family I used to hang out with. Charlie and Hakeem actually sat next to each other on the plane ride, which you'd think would be a recipe for disaster, but apparently it was an ideal atmosphere to talk because by the time they landed, they were on good terms again. Charlie clarified his wishy-washy friendship status with Hakeem, and Hakeem was optimistic. But by February, he still didn't have a contract extension. So what'd he do? Played the best basketball of his life and led the Rockets to a resurgence. Why'd he play so hard for a management that still wasn't respecting him? That's just who he was. His performance caused teammate Tree Rollins to declare there are no problems with his work habits. You listening, Steve Patterson and Charlie Thomas? Then, in March of 93, Olajuwon finally got a contract extension that was competitive with the other star centers in the league. He signed a deal for $30 million that would keep him in Houston until 99, or, as his agent enthusiastically put it, forever. The dream was ready to put the past behind him and move forward by a lot. The Rockets finished the 93 regular season with a record of 55-27. and 27. 
They nearly made it to the Western Conference Finals, but lost to the Supersonics in overtime of Game 7 by just three points. Hakeem was Defensive Player of the Year, with numbers that seemed to say, I deserve whatever contract I want, please do not challenge me again. The Rockets were back in the title conversation, poised for an even better performance next season. Over the summer, Charlie Thomas finally sold the Rising Rockets for $85 million. And the new owner got rid of Steve Patterson before the season started. But the city of Houston remembered Patterson fondly because he had a big hand in putting together the 94 team, who went on to win the goddamn NBA Finals. Hakeem was league MVP and finals MVP too. And then the next year, they did it again. The beef was over and done, easily forgotten. There's something about winning two championships in a row that makes you be like, what? What bad time? Shut up, I'm trying to get this champagne open. Oh God, there it goes. There is an alternate universe where this beef didn't get resolved, where everyone just slept the whole plane ride to Japan and Hakeem got traded and took his MVP talents and perhaps several championships to some other city. But instead, look how happy he is, given these aren't the people who wronged him. They didn't get to be here. Thanks for watching. If you like us, or even love us, hit that subscribe button. And uh, why not watch some more Rockets Rewinders? That's a rhetorical question, no need to answer in the comments. For Secret Base, I'm Clara Morris. Good night and good game. <laughs>